Fag. Will sat on a concrete block across the street from Mrs. Duncan's rooming house, smoking a cigarette and talking to himself. It was the early evening of that Sunday. He liked to talk out loud to himself. He was always interested to hear what he might say. The day had passed with reading and walking and fasting, like every day since he had moved to Toronto. The only difference being the mass he attended with Mrs. Duncan. He could only smoke a few cigarettes a day because his body was too sensitive to the smoke. The fast had brought him to the point he was at. In the reduction of all frivolous activity, mainly because he didn't have the energy, he was left with the fundamentals of his existence. Breath, movement, thought, and voice. And even they were diminishing. There was no bite left in the air from spring, and there probably wouldn't be any bite in the air until it came back in October. He butted the cigarette under his foot. He ran a hand through his shoulder-length dirty blonde hair. He hadn't cut it and had stopped washing it altogether. He wore the same pants for seven days straight. He changed his underwear three times a week. He bought all his clothes at thrift shops. He had grown a beard. Nothing really mattered to him. He had no job to go to, no studies to undertake in lecture halls, and no social obligations. He knew nobody in Parkdale except Robert Polsky and Dorothy, the waitress at the Dolphin Diner. It was a dangerous freedom. The longer he occupied it, the less likely he was to return to the normal life he had left. The freedom was intoxicating. He had no money problems. He had raided the bonds and securities left to him from well-wishing relatives at birthdays and other ceremonial events. His grandmother had given him $5,000 when he graduated from the University of Ottawa. His monthly expenses were less than 700 He walked most places he needed to go in Toronto. He bought books at second-hand stores. He went to a movie a week, sometimes two, but they were always at the old art house cinemas with cheap tickets. It was indeed a dangerous and intoxicating freedom. He lived in a world where people had occupations. He had to occupy himself. He was an economist by education, and so much of his time was spent trying to fully understand what he had been taught. An economist had a language, formulas, and money, but the economist stopped there. It was impossible to think outside of money, yet money was such a new invention in its modern usage. It was less than four generations old if it was pegged at the inception of the Bank of Canada. Money was much more important than politics. The elected officials in Ottawa reacted more than they acted, and their reactions were forced by money. It did whatever it wanted to do. The elected officials spoke in tariffs, levies, taxes, incentives and an endless campaign of policy to cope with the wily movements of money. It all sustained life, but it seemed to do more. It became a limitation to life, and this was by far William Tobe's most dangerous economic theory. Money limited life. The mass with Mrs. Duncan earlier that day had infected him with the presence of death. His child's mind had tried to get itself around the elusive concept, and he had tried again in his early teens, but it it just seemed so distant that he had never made the journey of imagination before. The mass had precipitated it. He was grateful to the old people in the pews and to Mrs. Duncan for pressuring him into going to mass. He had found life in the invisible presence of death, and death was the only thing outside of the economy, except for the burial business. The death he felt at mass had brought him closer to life. It was a puzzling thing for his economist's mind to contemplate. A fat man in pants that sagged to the crack in his buttocks and with shirt tails blowing up over his protruding belly pulled open the door to the dolphin. Wind chimes cut into the early evening calm. Where's compassion without pity or passion? Will asked himself as he watched the pathetic man hobble into the bar. Already close to intoxication, he closed his eyes. He didn't want to see what was around him anymore. Pity and passion are compassion. It's from the passions that compassion develops. Will opened his eyes quickly. He felt a rush of blood to his face. The voice that answered was not his, and he realized he had asked his question aloud. He could hardly tell the difference anymore. The man who answered his question had a thick red mustache, a fat round face, and transplanted red hair. He looked like a banged up 50-something cabbage patch doll. He was poop and scooping a couple of feet away from Will. He had a black dog some kind of mutt that looked like an oversized Rottweiler. 
It circled around him as though there was a perimeter that couldn't be violated. He scooped up the dog's business with a plastic bag over his hand and threw it and the bag into a second plastic bag. He twisted and tied the bag to contain the odor. Then he walked a couple of steps up a small grass hill. He stopped and stood in front of Will. Are you a fag? He said, and he grinned from ear to ear. End of chapter.